Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. With the doctor's help, the husband learned his wife's shocking readings. Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy it! Are you going to the doctor again? I asked. Yes, this is the third time this summer that I have had an infection, and I want to get rid of it. I could tell from her voice that this was important to her. It was important to me too. Every time she got an infection down there, our nightlife would stop until she recovered. This was already the fifth infection in a year. I hugged her, and she got into the car and drove away. I watched as she drove down the street and turned onto the freeway on ramp. While she was gone, I fixed the lawnmower and the lock on the back gate. She still wasn't there, so I went to play on the computer. I googled genital tract infections and read six different sites. I drank some iced tea and went back to the computer. I visited a few more sites and found something interesting. A woman becomes more susceptible to infections if she has multiple partners. Studies have shown that a woman's body gets used to one intimate partner and a new partner causes confusion in the system, which promotes the growth of bacteria. I heard her car in the driveway and closed my research. She stopped on her way home and bought dinner. She told me about her visit to the doctor and the new treatment she was prescribed. He gave her a packet of test strips so she could monitor her pH levels. If the itching was caused by a pH problem, the strips would show this. According to her, the doctor said that if the pH gets lower, it could be a problem. My research has shown that pH must rise to cause bacterial growth. She showed me the strips and a small book where we would record the results. I suggested doing the test immediately. She said the doctor had already tested her, and the result was 5.3. I said that if I took the test and got the same result, then I would know that I was doing everything right. We went into our bedroom, I read the instructions that came with the test strips. All the lights came on, and Lynn said she wanted me to hurry up because she was embarrassed. Of course, I smiled. 20 seconds passed. I kept the strip next to the packaging under our bedside lamp. After comparing, I saw that the result was 5.3, just like in the doctor's office. I wrote down the time, date, and 5.3 on the first page of the small book. Did the doctor tell you how often to test? Twice a day, and he wants me back in a week. What about the itching? I have pills and cream to apply after the tests. Fine. Perhaps this will help you get rid of this problem faster. You're saying that because you want to have a night with me again. I also want you to feel better, I added, smiling. I just want to stop the itching. Amen. Did he give you any other advice on what to do? Yes, but I'm not sure I can do it all. What exactly? When I'm at home, he recommends not wearing panties. He also recommends not wearing pants, either at home or outside. He said the air would help me recover faster. Why can't you do it? No, I will want to, but I promise I will leave you alone until you get better. It's going to be weird walking around like that. Weirder than itching? You are right. He also said no baths, just showers, and to use a hairdryer in that area after showering. Sounds like it will help keep the area dry while it heals. If you are serious about promising not to pester me all the time, I will do all of this. She was ready to try the doctor's theory. We had dinner, watched TV until late in the evening, and went to bed. I had been sleeping without clothes since I was 11. Lynn usually wore panties and an oversized t-shirt. As she started to pull up her panties, I asked, why? We tested her twice a day for a week, and she walked around without anything the entire time she was home. She wore white cotton panties to work because they breathe better in skirts. By the end of the week, her pH had stabilized at 4.3, and the redness and itching had disappeared. Her visit to the doctor was more joyful. He liked the table and recommended continuing to monitor her pH, maybe not as often. He also allowed her to resume intimate relations. I wasn't there, but I want to believe he said she could resume intimate relations with me. That evening, we had a night for the first time in 23 days. I was an attentive husband, I took her out to dinner, gave her a shower and massage, and gave her attention for over an hour. An hour after we did that, I said I was curious and tested her pH again. It showed 5.6, and she panicked. 
We talked, looked up some stuff on the internet, and an hour later we took the test again. The bar showed 4.7. We concluded that her body quickly restores acidity after me. We went to bed, and the next morning she asked me to test again. The bar showed 4.3. We happily got dressed for work, and everything returned to its normal state. In the first month, I noticed that she bought several new skirts. All her silk, nylon, and other panties were gone and were replaced with white cotton ones or no panties. When we were driving somewhere in the car, she would open the vents and direct the airflow under her skirt. I watched and didn't complain. Sometimes she caught me doing this, smiled, and called me dirty and old. I only smiled more. She stopped wearing long pants, and the shorts she wore were wide-legged, allowing for lots of airflow. Three months passed without new infections. I noticed that her scent had changed. It was the scent I loved when she was feeling good. I realized that when itching and discomfort were a problem, my first indicator was a change in her smell and taste. It had been months since her scent had been fishy. One Friday night, after she got home from work, we went to a party at our neighbors, Frank and Francine, who were celebrating their 15th wedding anniversary. We danced, ate barbecue chicken and ribs, and, of course, there was a lot of beer and drinks. Their house had two bathrooms, and after a couple of hours of eating and drinking, they were in constant use. Lynn has a small bladder and left the party several times to use the bathroom. It was about one o'clock in the morning when we returned home and went straight to bed. I was sure Lynn had passed out rather than fallen asleep. Within a minute of us getting into bed, she fidgeted a little, and I noticed that her hand was between her legs. It seemed like she was itching. I got up, took the test strips, and did the test. When I compared the strip to the packaging, I was shocked. She showed a pH of 7.2. The only way the rate would be that high is if someone other than me had an intimate with her, and it couldn't be me. I raised her pH to 5.6 after we had an intim, but someone raised it to 7. My mind started going crazy. I tried to rationalize that she was drunk and didn't know what she was doing. Then another part of my mind kicked in. She had no problem walking home or talking to me on the way. Naturally, I didn't sleep well that night. When Lynn woke up in the morning, I caught her itching again. I think we need to do a test, I said. No, it's nothing, she said as she prepared breakfast and we began our Saturday chores. She was in the laundry room and I was working in the yard. An hour later, I went inside to get a cold drink and saw her itching again. Honey, this is the second time I've seen you itch. I'll bring the test kit. I didn't wait, I just went for the set. When I returned, she said, forget it, I'm busy. We can do the test later. I stood my ground. Nick, I said, we'll do it later. They cost over a dollar a test, so let's just get this over with. I don't want you to get another infection. She leaned over and watched as I compared the strip to the chart on the package. It showed 6.6. .6. Something's wrong, I said. Call your doctor on Monday and ask what could have raised your levels so much and how to lower it. I know how to lower it. I still have the medicine he gave me last time. I'll start taking it right now. She left the laundry room and I went back to work in the yard. I knew the itching and medication meant we wouldn't have a night, but I was okay with that. I was sure she was having an intimate with someone in our area. If she had an intimate with someone else, I didn't want to have a night with her anymore. On Monday at breakfast, she promised me that she would call her doctor during her morning break. I knew her break started at 10 o'clock. I told her to call me immediately after talking to the doctor. I went to the medical building next to my office and talked to the gynecologist for whom I did computer work. I told him what I knew. He said he was sorry but signs indicated she was probably having a night with a new partner. Returning to the office, I waited for her call. At 10.40, my cell phone rang. It was Lynn. She cried and told me that the doctor told her she had developed an allergic reaction to me. I pointed out to her that it had been five days since we had intim. She suddenly stopped crying and asked what I was blaming her for. I blame the doctor for going crazy, not you. There is a medical practice in the building next to my office. I'll make an appointment for you and we can get a second opinion. Do you know the doctors in this building? Hell no, I don't hang out with doctors. 
it's probably more accurate to say that doctors don't hang out with guys like me. I called Dr. CST and told him what she had said. I asked him to examine her, check her, and if she was having an intimate with someone other than me, let us know about it together. He asked when the next party was in our area. I said I was planning a party this weekend. He made an appointment for Lynn on Monday and said I should come to his office, he had something for me. On my way home from work, I stopped by Dr. Seacrest for a minute. He gave me a tampon in a plastic tube and told me that if I fell asleep immediately after the party, I should take a swab, seal it in a tube, and bring it to his office on Monday morning. Lynn's appointment was scheduled for 1 o'clock in the afternoon. The rest of the week went pretty normally for us, no night. She wore skirts and made sure not to do anything that would make me notice her in an intimate way. She didn't understand that I thought about her intimacy all the time, whether she was around or not. What was unusual was that I was planning a party for her. I made up an excuse and told everyone in the area that the party was to celebrate the anniversary of our first weekend together. I bought food and hid it in neighbors' houses, purchased beer and wine, and arranged for two guys to bring their own grills to cook the meat. On Saturday, I took Lynn to dinner, and while we were gone, the neighbors got the party ready and started cooking. Lynn wore a colorful skirt and a peasant blouse to lunch. I put on khakis and a pullover. She ordered a salad, and I had a salad with shrimp. I told her how good she looked, and she thanked me, warning me that until we found out about the allergy, we wouldn't have a night. I laughed and said, that's normal. Only three days left, I will survive. As we drove home, I wondered if there would only be three days left or maybe forever. She acted surprised and even kissed me when she saw all our neighbors and found out why we were having a party. She even teared up when her best friend Linda told her that the party was organized in honor of the anniversary of our first trip to the ocean. Someone turned on the music and the couple started dancing. She and I danced a fast dance and then a slow one, holding my slender Lynn. Dancing with her was always a pleasure for me. At the end of the slow dance, she said, you better calm down before you dance with anyone else, and then she left my embrace and went outside. As the host, I made sure everyone had a good time. I helped clean up after the meal, threw the empty beer cans in the trash, and opened the windows for fresh air. Several times, I restocked the toilet paper, soap, and tissues in the bathrooms. Around midnight, I danced with Lynn again to the old Barbara Streisand song All in Love is Fair. When she spoke, I smelled a strong odor of alcohol and noticed that her speech was a little slurred. When the song ended, she kissed me and left. I went outside to help close the party. Two minutes later, I looked out the back door window and saw Lynn dancing with Willie Jordan. She was pressed against him. I heard the music stop, but they didn't let go of each other. I went down to the porch and took two bags of trash. I carried them to the curb and then walked back out onto our front porch. Willie looked at the back door and then kissed Lynn. The back door opened and Lynn pulled her hand away and broke their embrace. They looked around and saw another neighbor, after which they relaxed a little. I continued cleaning until all the guests had left and the house and yard were in order. When I got upstairs, Lynn was already asleep. I shook her and said, fire. She didn't move. I took a swab and did a smear. I put the tampon in the car and went to sleep on the couch fully clothed. Around 10 o'clock in the morning, she woke me up. Why didn't you come to bed? She asked. She was already dressed and ready for the day in a gray skirt and white blouse. Good morning. I just sat down to get some rest, and bam, it's morning. Go take a shower, I'll make you a good breakfast. After a party like this, you deserve it. This is just my way of thanking you for making my life so good, I said as I walked up the stairs. I showered and put on my khakis and dark brown shirt again. When I came downstairs, she was talking on the phone and hung up as soon as she heard me. So, what's for breakfast? I asked. French toast, sausages, and coffee, she gestured toward the table, and I saw my plate filled and ready. I sat down as Lynn bustled around getting ready for her day. She told me she had lunch planned with two women from work and then some shopping. I told her to enjoy shopping and not to spend too much. After breakfast, I cleaned up and went to check my email. I saw a letter from a neighbor and decided to wait until Lynn went shopping before opening it. 
Other letters were from work and distant friends, which I answered first. When Lynn came by to say goodbye, she saw that I was writing a reply to our friends in Orlando. Don't forget to say hi to me. Maybe we should visit them in the spring. Are you leaving? Yes, I'll be back before dinner. Do you want to go somewhere? Maybe we'll talk about it when you get back. She kissed me on the cheek, put her hand on my shoulder, and left. I opened a letter from Alan White, our neighbor. We played on the same basketball team a couple of years ago and remained friends after a fun but not very successful season. Nick, I may be completely wrong, but if the situation were reversed, I would definitely want you to say something. Yesterday at the party, I went upstairs to use your bathroom, and naturally, it was busy. I went into the guest bedroom and sat on the bed to wait. I could see the bathroom door. Five or six minutes had passed when Willie came out of the bathroom and hurried downstairs. I got out of bed and took a step as Lynn came out of the bathroom. She checked herself in the mirror in the hallway and then went downstairs. She didn't see me. Air freshener had been sprayed in the bathroom, but the smell lingered, which made me even more suspicious. This is what I saw. I hope I'm wrong and that my thoughts are unfounded. If you need to talk or need help, call me. Alan. I took the phone and called him. When he answered, I said, I already suspected something. I really need your help. Call Willie and ask if you can borrow something. Lynn went shopping, and I want to know where Willie is. Understood. I'll call you back in a couple of minutes. I opened Word and started making a list of things to do if our marriage ended. Thank God we didn't have any children who would be affected by this. I was at seven when the phone rang. Nick, it's Alan. He took Helen's car to service it. She's expecting him in a couple of hours. She has a blue Toyota, doesn't she? Yes, a RAV4. I want to go for a ride and drink beer. Would you like to join? Won't I be arrested? Think of it as fact gathering. Fine, I'll come to you and we'll go. Does your wife know what you saw? No. Then we can just go have a beer. Maybe we'll watch basketball on a big screen somewhere. Right then, the phone went off, and I prepared to leave. I took a new memory card for our digital camera, the camera itself, and my wallet. Alan was walking along my path when I left the house. We got into the car and headed off. We were silent for the first couple of minutes. I thought it was good that we didn't live near a big city where people could easily disappear. Finding them shouldn't be too difficult. Alan suggested driving past places where Willie could service Helen's car. Her car was on a lift at the third place we passed by. I usually don't pay attention to motels in town. I've never stayed in them. As we passed each one, we looked for Lynn's car. On impulse, I drove through the fifth motel and out into the back alley. Lynn's car was parked there. I took five photos of her car, two showed how close she was parked to the motel. I then loosened the valve on the front left wheel, and within a minute, the tire was flat. I parked my car out of sight and waited. An hour and a half passed, and Lynn went out to her car. As soon as she saw the flat tire, she returned to the room. Willie walked out, buttoning his shirt. Click. I took a photo of him leaving the room, buttoning his shirt, and walking next to Lynn. They talked in the car. Click. Then they opened the trunk of her car. Click. Willie changed the tire. Click. When everything was collected, he looked around. Click. He kissed Lynn. Click, click, click. Lynn got into the car and drove away. Willie returned to the room. Click. Five minutes later, we followed him to the shop where Helen's car was being serviced. He paid the bill and left. We drove to a nearby shopping center and saw Lynn's car in the parking lot. I used my key to open the trunk of her car. There were three packages, one from Macy's, one from J.C. Penney, and one from Brookstone. I took photos of all three and their contents. Then I swapped the contents, items from Macy's in the Brookstone bag, shirts from J.C. Penney in the Macy's bag, and Brookstone items in the J.C. Penney bag. We locked the car and parked a considerable distance away. Alan, Lynn said she dates women from work. You can go to the mall and see if you spot her. 
It would be nice if she didn't notice you, but if she does, it's okay. Just look who she's with. Let me take the camera. If she's with someone, I'll take a photo. I listened to the radio while Alan was inside. I watched them all doors, and Lynn came out first. She strolled to her car, holding only her purse. She sat down and left. Alan came out and waved to me. I drove up to him, and he got in. He showed me the photographs he took. She was sitting in the food court with a man I had seen earlier from her work. He was handsome, well-dressed, and it looked like his hand was on Lynn. She was playing with more than one person. We drove home, stopping for a beer along the way. While we were drinking, Alan asked what I was going to do. I told him I was torn between simply getting a divorce and causing real harm to everyone involved. He recommended caution. He was right, of course. At home, Alan went to his place, and I went into my house. Three bags were on the kitchen table. I called Lynn, and she came out of the bathroom. I was surprised you weren't home when I returned. I didn't know you were going anywhere. She looked worried. Alan and I went to have a beer and watch some basketball. It's not basketball season, is it? The sports bar plays tapes of old games, and if there's nothing live, they show recorded games. Men probably already knew who would win if it was all about winning. No one would watch anything except the final minutes. We're just enjoying the game. How was your shopping? I bought something for you. She opened the Brookstone bag and pulled out two blouses. She looked shocked, and I said, I hope they're not for me, I think they're too small. She found an egg-shaped clock in a Macy's bag. She handed it to me and said she hoped I liked it. I did, but her expression remained puzzled. How did things end up in the wrong bags? The egg clock was blue. Lynn, can I have the check? I think I would like a different color watch if they come in different colors. She rummaged through the bag and handed me the check. I looked at her and said, Lynn, can I see the receipts for the rest of the things? For what? Is there something wrong? While she was talking, I took the receipts out of the bags. They showed that the purchases had been made two days earlier during business hours. Sit down, Lynn. This is serious. The expression on her face was close to panic as she sat down. I sat down opposite her. You know that I am a stickler for truth and trust. I want you to tell me when you bought the things that are lying here on the table. I went shopping today. I didn't say a word, I was waiting. She didn't say anything else either. Lynn, where were you today? I went to the mall to do some shopping. Where else did you go? Only to the shopping center. You told me that you would meet your friends from work and go shopping. Call one of these friends. I need to talk to your friend. I won't. She'll think you don't trust me, and you don't know her. What's the big deal? It's a matter of trust. So you don't want to help me by confirming who you were with and where you were? You show me a receipt for a watch you bought two days ago and tell me you bought it today, and yet you expect me to trust you? Are you saying I lied to you? She stood up and almost screamed at me. I stayed where I was and spoke in a calm voice. I know you lied to me. I know you've been lying to me for months. I know where you were today and with whom. I have pictures of you with these people, and they are not women from your work. Photos? What photos? Of you leaving the motel room with Willie. She fell into a chair and burst into tears. It's not what you think. I can explain. Can you? It will be a classic. Can you explain why you were in the motel room with Willie and lied to me about it? I didn't lie to you about that. I asked where you were. You said you stayed at a motel with Willie. No. So you lied. But nothing happened. We were just talking. He's having problems in his marriage. Do you honestly think I'm that stupid? If nothing happened, why meet in a motel room? Why not tell me the truth? Lying makes you guilty. I have never had an intimate with anyone other than you since we got engaged. I love you. Fine. I want to talk to Willie on Tuesday night when I get home from work. I want him to tell me about your meeting at the motel. Can you arrange this on Tuesday evening here? Yes, I can arrange it. She began to relax. 
I took the egg-shaped watch and the receipt to return it. When I returned, Lynn was on the phone. Willie is coming Tuesday night, she said. Great. I went into the living room and turned on the TV. I watched movies until almost 10, then went to bed. Lynn was in bed wearing her standard t-shirt. When I lay down, she kissed me. She hadn't kissed me when she had the infection. I said, with my pH so high, I don't want to have an intimate today. I took the tampon to Dr. Seacrest at 8.30. Lynn arrived at noon, and we had lunch at a diner down the street from my office. Lynn said she wasn't feeling well and maybe we should cancel the appointment until she felt better. I said that I still had to pay, so it was better to go 10 minutes before the hour. We checked in, and the nurse gave Lynn a form to fill out. As soon as she finished, we were called in. The doctor took Lynn to the examination room and me to his office. Twenty minutes later, they both entered the office, and he sat down at his desk. He looked at the form and then said, I have good news and bad news. Which one do you want to hear first? I said bad news. Lynn said good news. Great, said Dr. Seacrest. Because the good news for Mrs. Peterson is bad news for you, Mr. Peterson. The good news, Mrs. Peterson, is that we know what's causing your problem, and it's easy to treat. The bad news, Mr. Peterson, is that your wife has had multiple intimate partners, and they have caused an infection. This can't be. Lynn said. While you were in the exam room, a nurse took a sample from Mr. Peterson. We compared it to the sample I took from you, and they are not the same. Science doesn't lie. Someone other than Mr. Peterson has had an intimate with you for the last three days. Lynn started crying. She covered her face with her hands and sobbed. After a suitable pause, I asked, What is the treatment? Lynn's head jerked up and she stopped crying. She looked at Dr. Seacrest, then at me. The doctor said, I can give her stronger suppositories, pills, and other things that her previous gynecologist suggested will also help. It would also help if all her partners used protection. There's no danger of her getting pregnant, as you already knew, but infections are a real problem. Can these prescriptions be obtained here in the building? I asked. Yes, I can send them directly to the pharmacy, and you can pick them up on the way. I would like to see you again in a week to assess the progress of your treatment. Please make an appointment at the exit. He opened the door for us, shook my hand, and pointed us to the front desk. I made a follow-up appointment for the following Monday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I gently placed my hand on Lynn's back and led her to the car. She didn't say anything during the two-minute walk. I opened the car door for her and asked, Do you want to stay married to me? Yes. Oh, honey. Shut up. Get in the car and drive home. When you get home, take a shower and make lasagna for dinner with a green salad. You won't talk to me unless I ask a question. You will carry a towel with you all the time because you will only sit on a towel and not on our nice furniture. When I come home, you will still be without clothes. Do you understand? She nodded, tears running down her cheeks. I helped her into the car, turned, and went back inside to get her medications. Then I returned to work and started working on a new project. When I entered the house, I noticed that the kitchen looked very clean and I could smell the lasagna. There was a good bottle of wine, plates, and glasses on the table. Lynn walked into the kitchen wearing three-inch heels and thigh-high stockings. In her right hand was a small towel. I was surprised. I expected nothing into him after all. She had an infection, and night was impossible. She started talking but remembered that she shouldn't. I continued, that's not the case now. Anytime I want night, I will have it. I think that because of your affairs with other men, I lost the opportunity to have an intimate with you 50 times this year. I want those 50 times right now. I want dinner. Please serve dinner. Dinner was wonderful. She stopped on her way home from the doctor and bought fresh meat and cheese for the dish. She sat on a towel and ate dinner without anything, except for her stockings and heels. When I finished, I stood up and headed into the living room. She put everything away and followed me into the living room. I turned off the TV. Lynn, I want you to call Willie and invite him here. I'm going for a walk for a couple of hours, and I don't want you to be here alone. 
You can sleep with him in the guest bedroom, but not in our bedroom. No. Let me be clear. I want you to sleep with him in the guest room. There's protection in the nightstand. Make sure he uses it. Do you understand? Tears streamed down her cheeks as she nodded. I got up from the couch and headed to the back door. Call him from the phone in our bedroom now. She walked up the stairs, and I opened and closed the back door. I didn't leave, I took our digital camera and hid in the guest bedroom closet. Ten minutes passed, and I heard a knock on the back door. I heard Willie exclaim when he saw Lynn, God, you look amazing. A minute later, they were in the guest bedroom, and a minute after that, I opened the closet door and started taking pictures. Willie was easily identified by the tattoo on his back and the long scar on his chest. Without letting him notice me, I took pictures. I hid the camera in the closet and went out, taking a place by the door. He headed to the bathroom, then saw me and froze. Lynn, come here. Sit here on the floor next to me. She didn't make a contact with either of us and did as I asked. Willie looked around for his clothes. He didn't reach for them, but he looked. I thought about knocking your teeth out before I got to Oregon, but I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that I decided not to. In fact, you'll love the plan. I want you to sleep with Lynn once a week. For this, you will pay me $500 each time, and you will also pay me $500 in cash for a club membership fee once a month. First missed payment, and the photos I have will be made public. I will make sure that everyone understands that this is not Helen and that Lynn's face is not visible. The pictures of your face are pretty good. What do you say? This is blackmail. His face was red, and his posture was angry and hostile. He forgot that he was standing without clothes in my house. This is purely business. You slept with her for months without caring about Helen or me. Now I'm offering you the opportunity to stop hiding, hoping I don't find out. I have a product, and you can rent it. Now you know the price. Since you've already been with her this week, I think it's only fair that we get her $500 and my $500 before Thursday. The money will need to be deposited into the bank account that I will give you. I gave the card sealed in a plastic bag to Lynn and told her to drop the card into Willie's hand. She did. I told him which bank I had a task for the next day, figure out what to do with the bank account. When I locked the door and went upstairs, Lynn was sitting on a towel at the end of the bed. You can speak freely, I said. Now I'm your woman of easy virtue, aren't I? Did you prefer it when I was your cuckold? I preferred it when you didn't know why. Now you can still have an intimate. The only real change is that I get paid for it. There's something else, isn't there? Willie may need to go on a business trip. You can go with him. He pays your expenses and contributes $1,000 a day for the days you are absent. Is it true? Her face looked like she didn't believe I would let her go. Is it true? Now go to bed and let's sleep. I lay down, and so did she. I hugged her from behind and fell asleep. When I woke up, she was already dressed for work and my breakfast was on the table. She greeted me with a kiss and said that she had thought about all this and my way of solving the problem was better than it deserved. She thanked me, kissed me goodbye, and left for work. Five minutes later, I left too. At ten o'clock, I called Lynn and as soon as she answered, I said, remember the day you went shopping? You met a man and spent time with him in the food court. He works in the same company as you. He is married. Yes, he's one of your lovers, isn't he? Yes. Tell him I'm out of town and you want to invite him to dinner tonight, early dinner, say between 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock. If he asks what's for dinner, tell him it's you. Are you serious? Very. Be convincing. Don't let him try to dinner. Call me on my cell phone when he tells you what time he will arrive. Then go home and change into the same clothes you wore for Willie. Change the bed in the guest bedroom. Yes, sir. Well done. I hung up and called a technician I knew, asking him to equip our house with audio and video recording equipment. I paid him well, and he did a great job. The cameras and microphones were well hidden, and the DVD recording equipment was in the attic. He called me at 3 o'clock and said he was done. He showed me how to activate the system, and we agreed to meet the next day to check if it was working properly. 
At 3.30, Lynn called and said she was heading home to cook dinner. Mr. Ballman will arrive at 5 o'clock. I thanked her for the call and hurried home to activate the system. I left before Lynn got home and left a dozen roses on the dining table. Alan and I met at a sports bar, watched basketball, and had dinner. I told him that we had misinterpreted what we had seen. Willie did have problems in his marriage and was receiving help from Lynn. I pushed them apart, and their stories not only matched but made sense. A man from work he was seeing was meeting her to ask about another woman from work he was interested in. At 9 o'clock, I returned home. The house was clean, and there were roses in a vase on the dining table. She was reading. When I entered the bedroom, she looked up and smiled. Welcome home. Did Mr. Ballman enjoy his dinner? I hope his wife wasn't counting on him today. I don't think he'll be able to get up until tomorrow. Did you use the medicine after he left? Yes. Very good. I need a shower. Perhaps you would be so kind as to wash me and take away the stress of the day? Yes, if that's what you want. We got into bed, and she said, I kept waiting for you to come out of the closet or somewhere else. Did he get a toll-free number today? I smiled. I'm the only one who gets free night from you. The day I find out that someone is sleeping with you for free, you and him will be dead. Clear? Yes, sir. Tomorrow after work, I want you to go shopping for real. Buy nice skirts, blouses, and bras, pretty clothes suitable for work. Buy many pairs of these stockings. Your budget is $11,000. She pressed herself close to me and kissed me. Thank you. It can be fun to be your prostitute. It could be fun and beneficial for both of us. My technician and I met at home and saw how well the system worked. I watched the DVD and it showed me how to make a copy of any recording on the system. After he left, I looked at Lynn's tapes with Mr. Ballman. I copied a short clip showing his face without revealing hers. I took a copy with me and reset the system so that one press of a button in the house would activate motion detection recording. That night, Lynn and I went out to dinner. She looked very cute, and we both enjoyed the attention she was getting in the restaurant. I tested her at home, and her pH was back to 4.3, just like it should be. We had a night. Dr. Cesis tested her for everything, and she was free of everything except the infection caused by her pH. The next morning, I left the office early enough to arrive at Lynn's office by 10 o'clock, during her break time. I saw Mr. Ballman walking down the corridor toward the main entrance. He didn't notice me, so I just followed him to his office. I noted the name tag near the door, Mr. Ballman. Yes, who are you? I closed the door behind me and said, I can either be your best friend or the one who ruins your life. Choose. Can we sit down and figure it out? He pointed me to a chair. As soon as I sat down, I planted a bug under the edge of his desk. I'd already installed one in Lynn's purse. They were expensive, but the range was worth it. The receiver was under the seat of Lynn's car. Mr. Ballman sat down at his desk. I noticed that his chair was slightly higher than mine, a gesture of strength. You met with one of the employees after hours. I'm sure your wife and boss won't appreciate the video I have. You are talking nonsense. Go away. I stood up and pulled the DVD out of my jacket. Here's an example. I have over an hour-long video of your meeting. I placed the card next to the DVD, make a cash deposit into this account at Merchant Bank before noon on Friday. The amount in cash is $1,000. You can make an appointment once a week. The price is $500 per session and $500 per month for membership in her club. The $1,000 you contribute will cover last night's and this month's dues. As I was driving back to work, my cell phone rang. It was Lynn. She was very upset. I calmed her down and asked what happened. Mr. Ballman called me into his office and yelled at me. He said he would arrest us both if the video surfaced. He threatened that someone would beat me and disfigure me. Nick, he scared the hell out of me. You did everything right, dear. There was a bug in his office. His threats have been recorded and will be with the police soon. The only way to avoid this is to deposit money and come to the next appointment. I don't think he'll come. I think he'll fire me. 
Then 50 copies of the DVD with his face on it will surface, and his life as a leader will be over. The first copy will go to his wife, and the second to his parents. Will you protect me? Her voice sounded like that of a frightened girl. No one will hurt you at the office. I packed up the blank discs and mailed them to Mr. Bauman's address, addressed not to Mrs. Ted Ballman, but to Caroline Ballman. The post office was on the same block as my office, so I walked over and mailed it with no return address. I paid extra for next day delivery. I invited Lynn to dinner to calm her down. When we got home, I checked my account balance. As of last night, the balance was $1,100, now it was $2,100. Mr. Ballman gave up. I called Lynn on her cell phone and said, The money has arrived. Nobody will disturb you today. Have a good lunch. She laughed and thanked me. I went looking for a motor home. We created a new calendar program on our home computer. This was Lynn's schedule. The first entry was about her next date with Willie. He chose Thursday evening. We blocked out time slots when we needed to do things and I printed out a weekly schedule showing time slots for Mr. Ballman. I could have given him many options, but I decided that six free time slots a week would make it clear that he was not the only one renting my wife's body. I handed the printout to Lynn and said, On Monday, show him the open time slots and let him choose. Let him know that the meeting will take place after the deposit, not before. Call me on my cell phone and let me know which one he chooses. Wow, you're much better at business than I thought. I already thought you were good. Thank you. I told her my idea for a motor home as her new office, and she approved of it. She asked if we could also use it for vacations, and I thought that was a good idea, too. We spent Saturday checking out motor homes throughout the region. We immediately brushed off the big buses. Lynn was afraid to drive them, let alone start and operate them. When it began to get dark, we were more than 60 miles from home. One nice saleswoman, knowing where we were from, suggested that we have dinner and then come back and spend the night in the motor home we were looking at. She provided us with bed linen and pillows, and we agreed. We drove the RV to the mall, parked away from most cars, and ate dinner at the Outback Steakhouse. Back at the motor home, Lynn sat behind the wheel and drove around the huge parking lot to get used to the controls. We got back to the dealer before nine and parked for the night. We closed the curtains and locked the doors. I went outside to check what needed to be done to make sure no one could watch Lynn and her men except me. I took some notes. Lynn thought this camper might be useful to her. The saleswoman called it a Class C, which meant it was originally a van, and then the company built temporary housing on it. It was three years old and cost someone about $60,000. In the current economic climate, I was confident that for $19,000, this motor home would be ours. Lynn wanted to test the bed, and we did. I made notes about this too. We started the generator for an hour. It was very noisy outside, and unless it was really hot, I wouldn't let Lynn run it. It was necessary for the air conditioner to work. The air conditioner worked well. We also tested the heating system, and it worked well and didn't need a generator to run it. We went to bed and slept well. In the morning, we were woken up by a knock on the door. The saleswoman called, open up. I brought breakfast. Okay, open the door, I said. I pulled on my shorts. Lynn looked around and didn't immediately find her shorts, so she simply opened the door. The saleswoman, Sally, handed a bag of food to Lynn and brought three cups of coffee as she walked up the steps to the motor home. She closed the door. Lynn took breakfast out of the bag and set the table for the three of us. I think you've made yourself at home here, so what's your solution? Sit down, let's talk over food, I said. I am hungry. Lynn placed a small towel on the seat and moved over to make room for Sally or me. I invited Sally to sit where she was comfortable. She hesitated a little when choosing a place. Would it be better if Lynn covered herself? Yes, it will. From the moment she opened the door, I've been trying to come to terms with the fact that she's without clothes. I felt a little uncomfortable, so I found a t-shirt and handed it to Lynn. She apologized, saying she forgot that most people don't walk around without anything at home. Sally sat next to Lynn, and the three of us ate and talked. I asked about Jack's to stabilize the motor home, and Sally quoted a price, including installation. I inquired about thicker and longer curtains. 
She gave us a price and said Lynn or I could choose the fabric from the samples they had in their office. We discussed everything, and with sales tax included, I needed to spend $2,800. Lynn got dressed, and so did I. We met with the financier, and three hours later, we were on our way home. Sally called a place where we could store the motor home and provided us with guides to campsites and service centers. We installed and tested new electric jacks, new long curtains that will never have gaps, and a full complement of fluids, fresh water, propane, and gasoline. Lynn drove the camper, and I followed in her car. I saw Walmart ahead and honked at Lynn. Her turn signal came on, and we were soon parked in a Walmart parking lot. When we went inside, I said we needed radios, bed linen, and a mattress. There was a large mattress store next to Walmart, so we went in, and Lynn bought a new mattress for the RV. They installed it and disposed of the foam mattress that was in the camper. As we walked through Walmart, we found things we needed for the RV and purchased many of them. Afterward, we locked the camper. I paid rent for three months and was happy with our place. It was not visible from the street. Lynn asked me why I didn't throw her out when I found out she was sleeping with other men. I explained that I had invested almost 10 years into our relationship and didn't want to throw it all away. I spent almost 10 years wanting her to be happy, and I realized that for her happiness, she needed more intim on the side than she could get from me. In my mind, the only way to make her happy was to support her in it. Most men would have kicked me out, and I would have been alone that night. I'm not most men. Are you? The majority of women? What are you asking? What if Sally was a free spirit this morning and got without clothes, then had an intimate with both of us? Would you be okay with that? Or if I just had a night with her? She looked at the table, but I was sure she was only seeing a mental picture of me. She was silent for a while. My mind went to the idea that if I had an intim with her, it meant I didn't love Lynn. It's good that my mind didn't stay there. I thought so too. What does he have or do that I don't have or don't do for Lynn? Are you going to have an intimate with other women? Yes. She looked into my eyes and softly asked, Are you there yet? No, but if Sally had taken off her clothes, I would have tried. She is and still is damn attractive. It's my fault, right? I don't care about guilt. The point is that you sleep with other men. What keeps us together is not night. What keeps us together is that we both want what makes us happy. So I can sleep with whoever I want and still have what I have with you, as long as you're okay with it as I am with Willie and the others having an intimate with you. Will you make money by having night for us? I thought about it. With your help, I think we can make a lot of money from this. So to answer your question, yes, I plan to make money from intimate. I haven't fully thought it through yet, but I'm working on it. We left one radio in the camper and put the other in my car. At home, we completed all our weekend responsibilities, and by 10 o'clock, we were in the shower getting ready for bed. As we got into bed, Lynn asked me a good question. Okay, we have a motor home. Where can I take it on Thursday to meet Willie? We need a large parking lot, but not too busy. Do you know the area near the Wonder Bread factory, where all the warehouses are? Yes, trucks come and go often, but not many shoppers or mothers with children going to school. You can park in one of their lots, then call Willie and tell him the address. Next week, we will meet in another place on another day. We need to change the schedule every week. I don't want the schedule to be too easy to follow. I will need to drive around the city after work and look for suitable parking. I can make a map and tell you where I will be for each meeting. The radios will allow me to keep an eye on you and make sure you are safe. We kissed and went to bed. The next morning, I contacted a tech friend from my office and hired him to install cameras in the RV. Three cameras were enough to cover the interior completely. By the end of the day, he had installed the system, and we tested it. I left it in the parking lot to work, and when I returned, it took ten minutes to find one of the cameras. I found the other two only when he showed me where they were. I was a little worried that I had invested almost $25,000 and only got $2,000 back, but then I remembered how it was several months after starting my business before I saw the first money. Lynn called me and told me the time Mr. Ballman had chosen, Wednesday at 1 p.m. He booked a hotel room half an hour away from their work. 
I asked Lin to remind him that the deposit was due by noon the day before any appointment. We visited the motorhome in the evening and supplied sheets, soap, and other supplies. Lin didn't notice the camera. When we finished, I asked her to take off her clothes, and we had a night. As we exited the motorhome, I opened the outer storage compartment and took the DVD out of the recorder. What is this? She asked. Insurance. Let's go. When we get home, I will explain everything. Twenty minutes later, I inserted the DVD into our home player and turned on the TV. On the screen, I saw myself undressing while Lynn was also undressing in the motorhome. The audio recorded every word, sound, and sigh during our intim. This continued until I turned off the recording before we left the camper. Now I understand what you meant by insurance, but how can I turn it on and off? There is a power distribution panel next to the door with lots of switches and lights for things like the generator, air conditioning, and switching from battery to AC. There's a switch labeled REF for the refrigerator. Lynn said, EX. It turns on the recording system just like here in the house. It records 8 hours of activity. If you turn it on and sit down to read a book, it won't record. When you get up, it will turn on and start recording. When you stop moving, it will wait 5 minutes and then turn off. You don't have to turn it off at the end of the date, and you don't have to change the DVD or anything. I'll take care of it all. When I meet Mr. Ballman, I will be at the hotel. There will be no video, there's a bug in your purse. I can listen to everything that happens in the room before you come in. Tell me the room number. If something unexpected happens, I will be in the room as quickly as I can. Everything that is said next to your purse is also recorded, again for insurance purposes. Wow, I better be careful what I say about you. Yes, that would not be pleasant. And if I hear something unpleasant about myself and you're not on a date, you'll have to pay for it. I understand that Willie needs to hear that he is a better lover than me. This is business. She went to the hotel with Mr. Ballman. I parked in the hotel parking lot and listened to them. He was an arrogant man who demanded things rather than asking politely. He used words and phrases that almost made me angry enough to beat him, but I realized that he was provoking us by provoking Lynn. He wanted us to stop playing so he could stop making financial contributions. He didn't hit her or make her say the panicked words she would have said if she needed help. Half an hour later, after they entered the room, he got dressed and left her in the room. She showered and got dressed before leaving. She went back to work, and so did I. The next day, she drove to the parking lot, left her car, and rented a motorhome. She parked in the lot of an electrical goods company. People were coming in and out of the lot, but not too many, and she parked at the very far end. Fifteen minutes later, Willie parked across the street and walked up to the camper. He knocked once, and the door opened. Nice camper, Lynn. It's yours. It belongs to a friend. I do him a favor, and he sometimes lets me use it. Do you like it? Yes. It has two things I love, a bed and a, to put on the bed. Yes, Willie, for the next two hours, I'm yours. Let's do what I love when you do it with me. This is business, and I know it. You're having an intimate with me for money. You're not paying me. I've been sleeping with you for months now because I like it. Your husband likes money, and you do too. Look at it this way, you're making a deposit somewhere so you can have a night once a week without the hassle. You don't have to wait for neighborhood parties or wait for Nick to leave town. Money is freedom and convenience. I hate paying for night. You don't pay for intim, you pay for privacy, security, and peace of mind. I sleep with you for free because I love having intimate with you, and now I have a new bed that we haven't used yet. Don't you think we should use it and have some fun? A minute later, they were already having a night. What day is next week? Willie, Wednesday. No, that won't do. I'm busy on Wednesday. How about Tuesday? I heard the pages turn, and he said, it must be in the morning. How early? At half eight or nine. Fine, at half eight on Tuesday. I'll call your mobile at eight and tell you the address. I heard the door open and then close. I watched as Willie crossed the street and got into his car. I called Lynn on the radio. 
She replied, Reception, is that you, good friend? Yes, get out and return the motorhome to your friend. I'll be home around 6.30. Oh, don't forget to take your meds, honey. Thank you. I returned to the office and transferred the work I had done while sitting in the car onto the office computer. When Lynn got home, she washed the sheets from the camper and cooked dinner. She called me on my mobile and said that dinner would be on the table at a quarter to seven. I made it home in time to wash up and sort out the mail. Over dinner, she told me that when she returned to work, Mr. Ballman gave her a note that said Tuesday from half two to half four. After dinner, I drove to the parking lot and reset the recording system. I marked the DVD with the date and labeled it number one. Willie was now just a number. At home, I put the DVD in a drawer and realized that I would have a large DVD collection, so I needed somewhere to store them. I emptied one drawer in my desk and decided that once I had 10 DVDs, I would open a safe at the bank to store them. Each time I collected 10, I would move them there. When I walked into the bedroom, Lynn was without anything and sitting on the bed. She raised her head and smiled. I love that smile, but I wonder why it's there. I used to worry all the time that you would find out and throw me out or beat me to a pulp. Now that worry is gone, and I feel great. Tell me about some women you know, I prompted. Are you looking for a cutie? She teased. She talked about the women she knew, but most of them weren't opportunities. They never shared stories of their frustrations with Lynn. However, since she started her new job, she had met one woman who was a real possibility. Mrs. Aurora Clark, the neglected wife of Mr. Clark, Mr. Bowman's boss. The day she moved into her new office, Mrs. Clark was her first call. Mrs. Aurora Clark spoke with Lynn almost every day, impressing her during their initial conversation. Lynn noted that Mrs. Clark called a couple of times a week. In short, Mr. Clark was more interested in business than in pleasing his wife. Ask her if she has a computer, I suggested. If so, recommend that she call my mobile number and ask for an upgrade. Let her know that the first visit is free. I can offer this when I talk to her. Are you my husband? Lynn laughed. No, but you can tell her I'm married. Married women prefer to get involved with someone who is married. They think he is less likely to want her to leave her husband. Fine, I'm expecting her call tomorrow. Maybe she'll call you then. Can you check Mr. Clark's schedule without drawing attention? Certainly. Do you want to know when he will be out of town? This will make things easier. The next day, I received an email with a photo of Mrs. Aurora Clark in her phone number. In the photo, she stood in her garden holding a glass of champagne and smiling. She wore a summer dress that showed a lot of skin and generous cleavage, nice legs and beautifully tanned skin. She looked about my age. The letter said, I talked to her. She gave me a photo to send to you. She wants you to call her before noon today and offer her a good deal on a computer upgrade. I called, and the conversation was strictly business. We made an appointment for a free estimate. While we were talking, I received a new email with her husband's schedule. He was flying to Tampa Bay for the weekend, his plane took off in three hours. Mrs. Clark, I have a cancelled appointment for this evening. If you want, I can come evaluate your computer today. At what time? How about 6? His plane takes off at 1645. I think that will be fine. But will I distract you from your date with your wife or something? No, I'm married, but my wife is in San Diego tonight. In fact, she will be out until noon tomorrow. Are there any other plans? If I weren't dating your computer, I'd be watching a professional basketball game on TV. Are you a fan? Only when I have nothing else to do. She gave me her address, and we ended the conversation. I called Lynn. Are you free tonight? I won't be there when you get home from work. Will you be gone all night? If you're lucky. Do you know how much Mr. Clark is worth? He is the executive vice president of the company. Without any guesswork, I'd say he makes half a million a year. Pleasant. I found it on Google after looking at five different sites. I got a pretty good picture. He is 50 years old, has worked for Buick for many years, and is now the executive vice president of one of the major parts companies for GM. 
He received his MBA from Yale and married Aurora the same year he transferred from Buick. Her family is very rich, old money from tough New England. I went home, showered, shaved, and put on fresh clothes. I parked a block away before six. At six, I pressed the button next to the gate. Hi, I'm here to evaluate the computer, I said when I heard her voice. She let me in, the gate opened, and I drove up to the house. I parked on the side, not in front like a guest. She opened the side door as I got out of the car. I smiled, she was wearing loose shorts and a fitted top, barefoot with her hair still a little damp. We exchanged greetings, and she led me to her computer. We talked while I removed the casing from the tower and looked inside. Mr. Clark had bought her a nice machine. I launched it, and after it loaded, I looked at what was inside. I discovered he had installed two different programs to monitor keystrokes and found that no one had ever checked them. I concluded that he didn't even know the monitors were there. I removed some things she didn't want or need and made the computer faster. She watched everything I did. Half an hour later, she said, talk to me. I told her what I found and what I did. We discussed programs for monitoring keystrokes. She didn't flinch. Fine. You're good. Michael had one of his technicians look at the machine, and he couldn't find any monitors. Now do you want to see my real computer? Yes, you're much smarter than Michael or anyone else knows. One day, I will tell you a story, but not today. She led me to an outbuilding that had once been a stable, perhaps a hundred years ago when there were horses there. One room contained boxes of tissue and two industrial sewing machines. She moved the tissue box and pressed a button, and the door opened, leading us into a small room. I was delighted, she had thousands and thousands of dollars worth of high-tech computer equipment. She sat down and said, Do you know my husband? No, we've never met. I know. On the phone, you said your name was Pete. This is Nick. Your wife works for my husband. Yes, Ballman is her boss. She slept with him for a little over a year. You know everything about it. Fine, you are good. No, you are incredible. Do you know why I wanted to meet you? For at least three reasons. First, use me to make money. Secondly, to get into him. Third, maybe add me to your stable and make money by having a night with me. Okay, guilty on all counts. Why am I here? I want you to help me destroy my husband. By the end of the year, I want him to either be sitting in an 8 cell in some terrible prison or living in a small, dirty studio with rats and cockroaches as neighbors. You don't love him? You too, Mr. Yes. Ballman pilled your wife by having intimate with her and then handed her over to my husband. He had a night with her. This was the first major infection she got last year. Her fingers tapped the keyboard as she held her finger over the enter button. I have it on video. Do you want to take a look? No, I believe you. I wanted to find both men and hurt them. Having intimate for pleasure and profit is one thing, intimate without consent and disregard for someone's health is completely different. Are you in? Yes, and Lynn too. I know I've kept in touch since she got promoted. She'll get promoted again, money is good. You don't have to worry about money. We're already rich and going to make a few million more. I hate to argue, but you're the one who's rich. I spent 25000 setting up our small night business and have made less than 8000 so far. She stood up and led me out of the computer room and into the apartment. For the next two hours, I did everything she asked. When I was tired, we rested on the big bed. Do you have a plan? Yes, but you're not angry enough yet. He married me to get access to my money. He got access to 1% of my money. He thinks that 1% makes him rich. On our wedding day, I found out he had an intim with three of my friends. He gave them 10000 in cash each. On the day of his going away party at Buick, he had intimate with his secretary. He told his secretary that he would hire her as soon as he got a new job. He didn't do it, instead, he sent her 20000 in cash and never returned her calls or emails. He's in Tampa Bay right now for a football game. He doesn't care about the game. He's got his eye on a cheerleader there, and now they're having dinner. In an hour, he will have a night with her, and she will lie to him, saying that he is good. 
he's not that good. Why are you still married to him? If I initiate a divorce, he will be able to take money that does not belong to him. It wouldn't hurt me financially, but he would live well on the money, and that, dear Nick, won't happen. Remind me never to cross your path. If you ever wake up feeling like there's a truck parked on your chest, you'll know you've crossed me. I am hungry. My cook made us pork ribs, beans, and cornbread. They are in the oven to stay warm. Let's eat. She took me to the main house. Dinner was incredible. The meat fell off the bones at the slightest touch. The cornbread was made with corn kernels baked in it. She brought me back to the computer room and said, let's check on my husband. A few keystrokes later, the monitor showed the inside of his room. He had an intim, he's an idiot. We turned off the screen, and I noticed that she hadn't stopped recording. What do we do next? I asked. I think Lynn should help us. She can invite Carl to invite my husband with them. Carl is not Mr. Bowman's first name? No, he likes his first name, Bradley. He says it is the name of a rich man. I call him Carl, his middle name. What happens when the three of them are together? They will be discovered by the paparazzi since your wife will be in the game. We will set it up so that everyone will think that she did not consent to intimate. It will happen at work, they will be destroyed, and your wife will make a lot of money. She will speak on Oprah, on Dr. Phil, on Letterman, and get paid very well for her story, a poor working woman who was taken advantage of and mistreated by her bosses. Crap, I like it. She pressed a few keys, and the monitor showed our bedroom. Lynn is lying in bed. She's so hot, said Aurora. Neither man can resist. Aurora turned off the monitor, and we returned to the main house, carrying our clothes. We took a shower together and went to bed. When I woke up, Aurora was sitting next to me on the bed. She looked me in the face and said, Do you have a cell phone? What for? Call Lynn. Let her go to the IHOP near your house. You will go after her and bring her here by evening. We will be a trio seeking revenge and justice. I rolled over onto the edge of the bed and found my phone in my pants. Lynn answered the first call. Hello? I love you, Lynn. Have you ever met the lady I work for? No. Then get dressed and meet me at IHOP. Don't come inside, just park and get in my car. What's happening? Trust me, you want to meet her. Fine, give me half an hour. As promised, 30 minutes later, she parked at the end of the lot and got into my car. Aurora sat in the back, crouched down. When Lynn sat up, she saw Aurora. She closed the door and said, Good morning to both of you. I drove off, and Aurora talked to Lynn at the gate. Aurora gave me the code, and the gate opened. She told me to park at the stables. A couple of hours later, Lynn was still in shock. She agreed to be the victim of two men and quickly became Aurora's friend. We walked from the computer room to the guest room, and as soon as Lynn walked in, she said, You had a night with her in this room, and the plan is for Nick to have an intim with both of us in the same room. Both women woke up before me and got into a conversation about men in general, me in particular, and the two men who were their targets, Carl and her husband, Michael. I listened. After a while, Aurora whispered in my ear, We know that you're not sleeping. I kept my eyes closed because you're both so beautiful that I would be distracted if I looked. They kissed me back. We ended up having one more meal and spending the night back in the guest room. We decided to release Willie from financial obligations and ensure his silence by preserving the DVD. The money we get from Carl and Michael will make up for what we lose from Willie. Within a week, Michael returned from Tampa and Aurora asked him to hire someone to manage the apartment building she had purchased. It was a small house with only six apartments, and she indicated how much money she wanted to receive from rent each month. He agreed to take care of it for her. She told me that she asked for too little, he could get all the money she wanted by renting five apartments and keeping one as a playroom for Carl and himself. As soon as he started renting out apartments, Aurora realized that he would only rent to single women and have intimate with them. She hired her boys to pretend to be part of the painting crew and install video systems throughout the building. He kept apartment 6 for his own personal use. He asked the painting crew to install soundproofing between the 6th and 5th apartments so that the woman in the 5th could not hear what was happening in the 6th. 
Six weeks passed from the time I met Aurora until Lynn was taken into Mr. Bauman's and Carl's apartment. For weeks after I met Aurora, I met Willie. I followed him to the diner, where he bought lunch. I sat down with him as his mouth was full of corned beef sandwiches. Willie, I like you. I'll make you an offer. If you like it, you can stop making deposits in both the bank and Lynn. You can also keep everything a secret. I will keep the DVD for seven years in case you decide to talk to someone about your misdeeds. He swallowed a bite of his sandwich and asked, Are you serious? I nodded and said, I'm serious. The matter is over, and you are free. The price is silence. Agree? Is Lynn okay with this? She'll miss a night with you, but she'll be fine. Thank you for worrying about her. It will make her happy. Whenever we're at a neighborhood party or see you socially, you won't make a move on her. I'll find out, and I won't say anything if you do this. I'll just send 50 DVDs of you. Understood? Yes. Safe, and it's over. Have a good lunch. I left him, and he finished the rest of his sandwich. The following week, Lynn had an intim with Mr. Ballman in a motor home. Lynn parked near the lake, and Mr. Ballman parked his car at the dock and walked over. When their activities were over and Lynn and he were dressed, he asked if she wanted to add anyone else to their activities. She asked with whom, looking surprised when he said Mr. Michael Clark. She wasn't surprised, but she looked shocked. They agreed to meet next week on Wednesday, but Mr. Ballman wanted to change the location to Michael's apartment. He would pick her up from work and bring her back after the date. Lynn made the deal even sweeter by telling Mr. Ballman that next week there was no need to pay, it would be free. She didn't ask where the apartment was, both men felt safe there. They weren't. I gave her the handcuffs to put in her purse. She told Aurora and me the plan. On Monday, I went to the police. I met with Detective Saunders and told him what I suspected. My suspicions concerned only Mr. Ballman. I told Detective Saunders that Mr. Ballman had threatened her job if she did not have an intimate with him. Where and when? He asked. I gave him a branded brochure with his photo on it and a photo of Lynn taken at a party in our area. He promised to keep an eye out and catch Mr. Ballman the next time Lynn was attacked during work. On Monday, Lynn asked Mr. Ballman if there was anything special Mr. Clark wanted her to wear. On Tuesday, Ballman called Mr. Clark and asked him to tell Lynn to wear black lace lingerie, a thong, a bra, and stockings, not pantyhose. Mr. Ballman called home and left a message for Lynn, your boyfriend wants you to wear a black lace thong, bra, and stockings, and me too. Lynn wore exactly what they asked. At the appointed moment, Lynn walked up the side door of the building with Mr. Ballman and got into his car. As they left the parking lot, they were followed by a gray Ford. After a mile, the pursuit gave way to a white van with a plumbing company logo on the side. Mr. Ballman parked directly in front of apartment number six. He walked out and opened the door for Lynn, supporting her by the elbow. When he knocked, the door opened and Mr. Clark let them in. I can tell you what happened next because Aurora and I watched in the video room in her stable. Mr. Clark kissed Lynn, and during the kiss, she dropped her purse. It opened, and Mr. Ballman saw handcuffs. He took them out of her purse and showed them to Mr. Clark. This could be fun, don't you agree? said Mr. Clark. A woman of easy virtue, he added. It was a gift, Lynn told the truth. It was a gift from Aurora. Then everything went according to our plan. The door to apartment number six swung open, and three uniformed police officers and two detectives quickly entered the room. One of the officers began taking photographs. Both men were arrested. Lynn was released, examined by two paramedics, and taken to the nearest hospital. Aurora called her husband from prison. He told her how he had been framed and that he could defeat the false accusations if they went to trial. He asked her to come and bail him out. She said she was busy and couldn't come right now. Maybe you should call your lawyer. She had already called his lawyer and told him that from that day forward, she would no longer pay any of her husband's legal bills. When Michael called the lawyer, he was told that he had to hire a lawyer before he would be represented. Michael screamed and swore at the lawyer, who hung up. When he tried to pay bail with a credit card, 
he discovered that the district attorney considered both men flight risks and convinced the judge to hold them pending trial without bail. If Leon had been allowed, he would have found his credit completed, as well as the account balances he thought he had hidden from his wife. I checked our bank account and found that $100,000 had been deposited. I picked Lynn up from the hospital and she cried all the way to the car. We drove to her work and she drove home in her car. On our kitchen table were two tickets to Los Angeles. We packed our things for the week and headed to the airport. Our plane was met by a limousine in Los Angeles. The driver only knew where to take us, nothing else. It was a beach house in Malibu. He gave us the key and carried our suitcases to the door. Inside, we found a typed note, enjoy a few days at the beach. Lynn won't lose her job, your lawyer contacted the company, and they know where Carl and Michael spend the night. Fly back in two days, your lawyer will meet the flight. We had a great time these past two days and nights. We returned by plane and were greeted by a limousine driver with a sign. Our names were on the sign, and as soon as we approached, he said they were waiting for us. The photographer took 15 photographs of us. We didn't watch TV news or listen to the radio while we were away. Someone leaked the story to the press. The photographer at the airport was only the first. By the time we got halfway home, the phone in the limousine rang, and the driver was directed to the police station. After two hours with the detectives, our lawyer hired by Aurora and someone from the DA's office, we were on our way home again. There was no trial. The district attorney convinced Carl, Michael, and their lawyer that the court would give them 25 to life. They accepted the deal and received between 15 and 25 years. We each got what we wanted, Aurora got rid of her husband and kept her money, Lynn found a new lover, and discovered many others. She realized that she liked women too. I made a steady income working for Aurora, living with Aurora and Lynn, two more than willing lovers, and enjoying great vacations with both of them. Oh yes, Aurora gave me that apartment building. This opens up a new story. Was it revenge or justice for the boys? Some might say that I should have thrown Lynn out into the street and moved on. Looking at my life now, I would say that I was lucky to keep it. What do you think of our story today? In my opinion, this story was quite appealing from a plot point of view because there are many interesting aspects of the story involved. What's your impression? Write in the comments. See you in the comments.